So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our session about the telecommunications industry in the future. I'm not sure who of you was at the Etihad Museum yesterday. There were some people, like, for example, the whole panel, and there was an exhibit about the personal belongings of some of the founding fathers of the UAA, and I spotted a old device, which all you know, it was a ring, to uh, uh, how, how is it called? A, a rotary dial telephone. You remember those things where you have to know whom you are calling and the number, very cumbersome to put in the number? All of us use them in the use, and so that's 30 years ago or even longer. And nowadays, telecommunication changed quite a bit. We all ha have interesting devices which we're using all the time. But not the devices only changed, the way we are communicating changed. In the past it was voice only, now we can text, we can chat, we can send images, we can have video conferences, we can even meet in an immersive environment in virtual reality. And of course the devices changed as well, from the fixed line phone, to the mobile phone, to smartwatches, to headsets, to wearable AI pins that came out this month, to headsets for virtual and augmented reality. But also the risks changed. In the past, if the landline didn't work, it was not nice, but it was just something that didn't work. Today, if the network is going down, our vital infrastructure is in danger. And there are other risks like scam calls, like cybersecurity risks. That is what changed in the last 30 years. And that is just the beginning. And we want to explore today a little bit more what's happening in the next 10 years. We want to look at the technology, at the applications, the use cases that this technology is enabling, and uh, if we have enough time, also a little bit about the risks. And for that, the Future Forum of Dubai assembled over 70 years of telco know-how here in the form of our panel. My name is Stefan, I'm working for Deutsche Telekom, and it's my pleasure to moderate this panel today. And I have with me, on the one hand side, Geneshi, he's research director at the GSMA Intelligence, with 15 years of experience. For those of you who don't know the GSMA, it's a global alliance of all the telco operators. And he's an expert for all relevant topics we are discussing today, like 5G, 6G, AI, IoT. And he's really a thought leader for mobile networks from a technology as well as a use case perspective. Next to him, we have Abdul Rahman. He's our local hero. He's a Director of Policies and Programs Department at the UAE Telecommunication and Digital Government Regulatory Authority. A very long title. <laughs> A lot of responsibility with him. Um, as an engineer with over 19 years of experience, he aims to create the best environment and framework for the digital, digital infrastructure here in the region. And last but not least, we have Lotfi from Meta, the company behind Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. Responsible for the connectivity and access policy at Meta, he works on creating a regulatory and policy environment for the connectivity of tomorrow based on his 20 plus years experience in the telco sector. So I think we know a little bit about the telco system in the past, but what's happening in the future? As we look at this space here, we are kind of in the orbit around talking about satellites. So, Kaneshi, how will non-traditional communication technologies, like, for example, satellite or low-Earth uh, orbit um, devices, affect our communication in the future? What's your thought on that? Yeah, thank you so much, Stefan, and hello, everyone. Um, let's, you know, talk about the traditional terrestrial networks. You know, so we've got the mobile networks, we've got the fixed-line networks. I we've seen how these networks have helped to extend connectivity to where we are today. But you still have people who are outside, you know, um, of these networks. Um, according to our research, um, it's about 560 million people who either don't have any form of connectivity whatsoever or at what we call the connectivity edge. So there's some coverage, but it's limited. It, it's poor. Um, this is a huge number. I mean, it's the size of maybe the USA plus, you know, seven, several other countries. So... How do we get these people connected? In the last few years, we've seen innovations um, in aerial technologies, satellites being one of them. We also have what we call the NTNs, the non-terrestrial networks. You know, uh, people talked about drones um, carrying connectivity. 
we think you know, that these NTNs, these aerial technologies will play a very important role in the connectivity landscape going forward. Um, it's, it's not just about connecting the unconnected, as important that is. I mean, that's really important. If we're talking about um, a digital future, then if you have you know, close to half a billion people, or about half a billion people who are not connected, you know, that's a significant number, and we don't want to leave anyone behind. So importantly, they're going to help you know, to connect the unconnected. But beyond that, satellite technologies, non-terrestrial technologies, will play a key role in enabling the networks of the future. You know, so if we are talking about ubiquitous networks, if we are talking about reliable networks, you know, then we're going to have to, you know, uh, we're going to need these um, aerial technologies to complement the terrestrial technologies that we have today. Uh, but what we need to begin to think about, you know, what kinds of partnerships can we pretty much um, put together to, to bring these industries to, you know, together. When I, when I joined the GSMA close to, to 10 years ago, you know, we, we really used the S word, satellite. But today, we, you know, we're talking so much about it. You know, so that's the mobile industry, that's the satellite industry, and there's a whole new ecosystem developing you know, around aerial networks. We need to begin to bring these ecosystems together to create you know, um, ubiquitous network coverage everywhere, but in urban areas, in rural areas, and even you know, in space, at sea, wherever, so we can have that you know, connectivity all around that can enable new, new solutions of the future. Okay, so connecting the unconnected, I think that's beyond dis discussion. But when it's about complementing the existing network, so what's it's the perspective from a regulatory point of view? Because you're competing different companies for the same resources like Spectrum. So what's your thought, Abdul Rahman? Yes, first of all, good, good afternoon, everyone. I know I have a bad voice, so mind me. Fortunately, this is a forum, not a concert. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm sure everyone will ask for a refund. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, I think we have a good experience in the UAE when it comes to connectivity. Uh, maybe I'll share a short story first. Uh, um, I had the pleasure and, and, uh, to meet one of the founders of the internet, uh, Dr. Steve uh, Crocker, a couple of years ago. And when I had this opportunity, I asked him a question. And it was about IP addresses, so if, if you're aware, uh, the internet uh, is based on IP addresses, traditionally IPv4, and there were a finite number of IP addresses, so 4 billion uh, addresses. So I asked them this question. I said, when you were architecting the networks back in the 1960s, end of 60s they started, why did you choose only f I know, addresses in a for 4 billion you know, devices. What, what was what you were thinking at the time? Basically, he said, we thought about what do we need to connect? And at the time, you know, computers were very, very expensive. And you would probably see computers or mainframes in large institutions, maybe universities, corporates. So we thought how many computers we would have. You know, they're very expensive. And we thought, you know, if every institution have a computer, we we'll still have, you know, a couple of zeros to fill. So we never thought that there will be a time where, you know, today you have, you know, probably tens of devices for, per person, maybe potentially even hundreds of them. So I think the point is you have to imagine the future. And today you have to think about what investments you have, you have to make. And we've done this in the UAE. I mean, the, the connectivity options we have from, from fiber optics to uh, 5G to um, even satellites. We have every possibility there. And we have to be technology neutral, i.e. we have to allow each and every technology to be tested, to, to see its potential and allow it. And, and, and of course, we have to have an environment where 
whoever investing in these technologies uh, potentially can be in a healthy business. They can, um, you know, get their investments back, you know, uh, and then reinvest again in, in the infrastructure. And, and this is what happened in the UAE. We invested in radio technologies, in fiber optics. Today we have fiber everywhere. We cover 99% of population with fiber optics. And today that's the, the technology that we rely on. Does it mean that we are there and we don't need anything else? Not, definitely not. And I'll give you an example. When you travel, for example, you are on an airplane. Nowadays, you know, you, you have very limited connectivity. You have very slow bandwidth on, on aircraft. And sometimes it's, it's peaceful. <laughs> you, you stop receiving these WhatsApp messages. But at the same time, maybe you need to run a business. Maybe you need to look after, you know, um, uh, your perf performance of a business or maybe uh, connect with, with your, you know, children or kids. And, and today, the expectation of user is that they want to see the same experience when they are an aircraft. And how this is possible? I think we have a solution. We have the low orbit, low Earth orbit satellites, you know, the like of uh, uh, Starlink, for example. And that would fill the gap of, you know, for example, in the aviation or in maritime and, and, and other in other industries. So the point is, we have to allow any technology that have value and promise to be tested, to be, you know, uh, invested, and then, you know, uh, of course, the regulatory framework have to adapt for this as well and uh, have to uh, allow it. And so, so all options uh, are, are open. Um, thank you, Abdurrahman. Um, actually, before joining Meta, I worked uh, for six years with a satellite company. So I just wanted to add uh, a bit on what has been said about satellite communications. Um, I think the satellite communication uh, used to be constrained by a number of factors, um, which led to the uh, access capacity being expensive and this perceived underperformance that uh, Abdurrahman uh, mentioned, which is the uh, issues with the throughput and the latency. Uh, but with the recent development and the launch of uh, Mega Leo constellations, I think these barriers are being very much reduced. Uh, to a level where I think uh, we, we are seeing now a paradigm shift um, whereby satellite connectivity or satellite communications are no longer a niche uh, market but may become uh, mass and mainstream in the, in the future. And actually this opened up uh, huge opportunities including for, for the telcos as well to expand uh, their reach. And this has helped with the um, um, the integration of the, the, the satellite link and the standards, the 3GPP standards for 5G and 6G, which was not the case before. The standards were done in silos for the satellite, and I think this integration will uh, help to uh, reduce the, uh, the digital divide. But again, I think it will reduce the connectivity gap, but I think we need to still look at the uh, usage gap, because I think there are studies by GSMA and the UN Broadband Forum that show now that the, uh, while the uh, connectivity gap is shrinking, there is still a big issue with the usage gap. So people that have coverage but are not able to, to use it because of digital skills, lack of digital skills, or issues uh, with affordability as well. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just give you those numbers if you don't mind. So yeah. 560 million not covered, but another 2.8 billion covered but not using the exactly. mobile internet. Exactly. So the usage gap is obviously bigger than the coverage gap. Yes. Okay, so that brings us to the usage. So what we learned is technology will solve so that everyone is connected and better connected than today. Yeah. The question is what will people are doing with the internet? The ones that are connected or that the ones that will be connected, especially when we talk about 6G. I mean, everyone is now talking about 5G and uh, has 5G on his phones, but we are as an industry already working on 6G. So, um, Kenishi, are there any specific use cases what you think um, 6G will enable that are not common today? 
Yes, I mean, there are, there are several. I want to believe everyone in the room, you know, uh, pretty much know the Gs, the 2G, 3G, um, 4G, and 5G. Now, 5G was quite transformational. I mean, if I start from 3G, basically, they have been developed to address future needs. So when 3G was developed in the 2G era, it was to meet the need for greater voice capacity and video calls, um, 4G to meet the need for mobile broadband, and 5G, which was transformational to meet you know, the need of industry verticals. So now we're talking about 6G. What, what's 6G? You know, what's, it, what's it meant to, to do? I think you know, um, the context will really give us the ability to begin to picture in our minds you know, what 6G could eventually do in terms of, of use cases. So we all know how 5G improved 4G tremendously. 6G will do even more you know, um, compared to 5G. So we're looking at, you know, um, about 100 times faster speed uh, for, for 5G. You're looking at, you know, five milliseconds in terms of um, latency. For 6G, you're down to the microseconds. And in terms of capacity, and this is really interesting, uh, for 4G, you, you could connect, you know, up to 400,000 devices, per, sorry, 100,000 devices per um, one square kilometer. For 5G, that's increased to 1 million devices you know, uh, per square kilometer. And for 6G, the expectation is up to 10 million devices per square kilometer. So what does this mean in practice and in terms of use cases? There are so many use cases that are being discussed you know, at the moment. Um, but as an industry, uh, we've grouped these use cases into four broad categories. So you're looking at you know, enhanced human communication, um, enhanced machine communications, enabling you know, new, new services. So these are you know, some of the broad categories um, that, that we're looking at. For specific use cases, I'll, I want to call out you know, um, a few of them. The first one would be digital twins, you know, interactive mapping. I think this would be critical for how smart cities and future factories are going to, to work. Because today, you know, you have the physical world. And if you wanted to understand what's going on in a city like Dubai, you may have to send your workers out you know, to, to different parts of the city to know where there are issues, what you need to, to, to change, and how you need to improve things. But where you have digital twins, you have a digital version of that physical world no matter how big it is. And with 6G, you can interact with it instantly in real time. You know, so where there is a leakage in a corner of town, okay, before you send your workers to go see it, you've already seen it in the digital twin. So it becomes a lot easier to tackle that problem, you know, um, you know and of course, faster to, to, to do that. It's going to transform healthcare. Talked about you know, the number of devices that can be connected to a 6G um, network. So what it means, you, know, you talked about people having tens of devices. Well, you know, in a 6G world, it's going to be hundreds of devices because it's not going to be only the wearables, your, your, your wristwatch or your you know, um, smart glasses or whatever, but it's also going to be devices that are in your body, you know, pretty much monitoring every vital you know, um, um, metric in your body and transmitting in real time to your doctor or your hospital, you know, so the moment there is an issue that can um, very quickly, you know, be, be, be addressed. So it, it goes on and on, but um, I don't know if any of these ones, you know, have my colleagues, you know, want to chip in to some yeah. of the use cases. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I, I need to clarify, at, at Meta, we are technology agnostic, so... Uh, but my personal view on the, uh, on the 5G, I think we are in the uh, uh, future forum here, but I think to build the future, sometimes it's good to look at the past and draw lessons from the past as well. Uh, so here when it comes to uh, 6G, I think now a number of stakeholders, including telcos and early adopters of uh, 5G, they are now questioning whether 5G delivered to its promise because uh, people involved in the development of 5G would remember this magic triangle of the use cases like the enhanced broadband, uh, the massive IoT and machine to machine, as well as the ultra reliable and uh, ultra low latency. And the use cases, they didn't follow. And 
I think for the future to build the 6G is not just a matter of incrementing the digit from 5G to 6G. It's really incrementing the value that the 6G will bring and enable new possibilities by 6G. And I think this is very important to take into consideration. Lotfi, if I may add on that. Um, I mean, yeah. you said more bandwidth, lower latency. That's always the promise of the next generation. Yeah. As we are talking about communication, how is communication going to change? For example, um, in the 70s there was Star Wars, there was the hologram of Princess and Leia, some of you remember. That's something that really attracts people and that people love it. So I'm not sure if we will have that with 6G, but I, I know Meta is working on more immersive experiences. So maybe yeah. you can um, tell us a little bit more what you expect for the future of communication enabled by 6G or whatever technology, Lotfi. Yeah, thank you very much. I think with the rapid evolution of technology, it's uh, always difficult to predict what will, uh, will happen uh, in, the, in the future, like 10 years from now. Um, but if you look at the evolution of the, uh, the forms of uh, uh, connecting people in the, in the past, as well as the underlying technologies and devices, uh, I think we moved from uh, connecting uh, through text to photos to videos and the underlying devices and technologies where uh, we moved from desktops to uh, feature phones to smartphones. I think the next logical evolution will be moving from this flat 2D experience to a more immersive uh, 3D experience, which we call the metaverse. So it's, it's um, a set of uh, connected digital spaces where people can connect, work, uh, play, and create in a very immersive uh, way. Um, and I think uh, some of the key enablers uh, to make this happen um, in, the, in the future, there are four main building blocks or pillars, uh, in, in my opinion, which are the connectivity, of course, the devices, uh, the creators, as well as the platforms. And all of this will be, uh, I think AI will be the catalyst in uh, all of these uh, four pillars. And I'll, I'll come to that uh, later. Um, a few words about each of the pillars. Uh, I think when it comes to devices, maybe it's good um, uh, to, to clarify some of the uh, misconceptions around the devices for the metaverse. Uh, it's true that now we are starting with the AR, VR devices. We have actually, uh, we produce uh, uh, the MetaQuest uh, line of uh, products, which is AR and, and VR devices, which will be used to offer this uh, immersive experience. Um, and in the future, maybe this will become more user-friendly through uh, advanced uh, smart glasses. But actually, we are, we are building the metaverse to, to allow a number of different devices to be connected, including uh, smartphones and tablets. And each of the device will offer a different uh, immersive experience. So this way, the metaverse will be inclusive. Um, on the platform side as well, uh, it's good to clarify that it's not only Meta that is building the Metaverse. I think other uh, companies will be building the Metaverse. We, we may have different Metaverses, and I think the challenge will be really to, to make them interconnected for people to move in a seamless way between one Metaverse to the other. Um, on the creator side, actually, I was listening to uh, His Excellency, the Minister of AI, this morning, when he, he said, regardless of the investment you put for future technologies, if you don't have the people that will use the technology and will develop the technology, this will be somehow useless. And I agree with him, and this applies to the create creators in the metaverse, because uh, it will be the creators that will create the value for people to, to, to use the metaverse. And it's, uh, it, it's really important. Um, maybe back to your question about the uh, uh, holographic uh, communications and whether it, whether it will become true or not. Um, I cannot answer that question. We'll see. Pity. But, what, yeah, but what I can say uh, that we are doing a lot of improvements in the way uh, the avatars are developed. And avatars are the representations, our own representations in the metaverse. Actually, if you look at the, uh, uh, the last uh, interview that our CEO, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, made in the, in the metaverse, it's available on YouTube, you will see how realistic the avatars are, are now uh, possible to make. Actually, they are very realistic in reproducing the facial expression, the facial details. Still now, we need like a few hours to come up with that scan for realistic reproduction, but 
I think in the future we'll be able to do this through our smartphones by very quick scan and we'll be able to use our avatars. How these avatars will be, will be reflected, whether in, as a form of holograms or uh, holograms or other forms, we'll discover. Yeah, I just wanted to add that actually holograms, you know, it's one of the expectations, you know, for, for 6G. So, so real life um, interactions where you, you could actually be in your car and, you know, people would think you're in your office because the, the low latency means that um, the way you interact with, with people, it kind of completely change the physical and the temporal, you know, distance, you know, between people. So it's going to bring interaction a lot closer. So yeah, holograms is one of the expectations for 6G. So there's hope for my dream. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but when I hear that, um, creating holograms, uh, managing the digital twin or all the data associated with it, we need not only humans to interact with all this data and making that happen, but we also need AI, which is one of the yes. themes of the whole Dubai Future Forum. In many sessions, I learned that today. So what do you think is the role of artificial intelligence in the telco space? Some telco carriers like SK Telecom or also Deutsche Telekom are yeah. saying we have to become an AI-driven company. Um, so what is, from your perspective, the opportunity, but maybe also the risk of AI in our industry? Mm. I don't know. Abdul Rahman, you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> maybe uh, I'll answer first uh, another question you asked about how the future internet could look like, or how the digital infrastructure could look like in the future. Before coming back to the risks uh, and, and uh, especially with the with the with the AI, uh, I think today the the buzzword is cloud. So everybody's saying you know everything is moving to the cloud whether it's, you know, your devices or, you know, factories, you know, relying on cloud to, you know, run their operations and health systems connected to the cloud, etc. I think in the future, and because of the latency problem, you know, this comes back to the latency issue, and this is one of the promises of 6G and other technologies, data have to be completely distributed. So you'll have to have processing power, data storage, AI capability, and everything in between in, in each, you know, I would say tier or each level. So you'll have it in your body probably in the future. You'll have it in your house. You'll probably have a mini data center in your house to solve the latency uh, uh, problem. You'll have it, you know, in your, your neighborhood, in, your, in the traditional data centers and cloud, a hub, so it will be everywhere. It's not just the cloud that we know, you know, Amazon, AWS, or Google Cloud, or whatever. It, it will be everywhere. And you need the connectivity and the infrastructure to connect everything in between. And some of them would be, you know, something like 6G or you know, uh, other technologies. It could be satellite. It could be some of the uh, free spectrum that we were talking about, you know, we have a WRC conference, the World Radio Communications Conference being held in, 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 in Dubai. And one of the hottest topic is, you know, how do we deal with uh, six gigahertz, for example, yep. uh, issue? You know, you, whether it's You mentioned, free. so I will say a few words about that. <laughs> <laughs> so so my, point, my point is data have to be completely distributed everywhere. And you have to have the capabilities everywhere to power, for example, artificial intelligence. And I'll give you a small example. Today, human, if they see a risk, let's say while you're driving your car, how much time it takes for you to realize the risk and take an action? On a normal person, it's 700 milliseconds. Now, if we rely on current technologies, if AI is somewhere in the cloud, it will take at least 100 milliseconds just to get all the information sent back to the AI, and it will take AI. For example, ChatGPT today takes about a second. That's too long. And, and this is an average person. We are not talking about, you know, Michael Schumacher uh, you know, responding with, you know, in, in, in F1. We're talking an average person. So it needs all these capabilities to be closer to, to, the, to, the, to, uh, to the user. Now, back to your question about AI uh, risk. I think 
AI still in its infancy. And a lot of people talking about risks and issues and anticipating problems and, you know, we have to solve it now. I think there has to be a balanced approach because it's still it's very, very early. And, of course, we have to think about principles. We have to think about tools that we can, in a careful way, so that we allow for the technology to, to you know, it has its space and tackle uh, 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 some of the uh, challenges. Not sure did I answer the question? Yeah, very good. So for an AI pioneer like Meta, is taking it slow also a good answer? Yeah, maybe just before answering the AI part, back to the, uh, <laughs> the Wi-Fi discussion. Actually, I thought I left this a few hundred meters away from here in the, uh, in the WRC. It's coming back, hunting. It's coming back, exactly. Um, but I think it's good to make the balance. Uh, we mentioned Leo satellites, we mentioned fiber, we mentioned 5G, 6G. Um, I think Wi-Fi is as important uh, because uh, Wi-Fi is low power technology and we believe that the wearables that will be used in the future uh, will actually take advantage of this, uh, the fact that it's lower power to save battery. And also uh, Wi-Fi, if it has access to uh, more spectrum, which we, we are advocating for at the WRC, it will solve this problem of uh, low latency. So this is just, we, we believe that, that the metaverse will run and evolve over Wi-Fi, uh, at least primarily. Uh, back to the AI question, uh, I think it's good as well to mention that uh, at Meta we, we were developing and using AI for a decade now. It's not uh, something new. So it's AI that really helped uh, to uh, scale up uh, and develop our platforms. And it actually it's used for uh, uh, news feed ranking as well as uh, tackling the issues with the harmful uh, content on the platforms to keep them safe uh, for our users. And now with the development of uh, generative AI, it's now, I think, we are creating this interface for end users to use the AI uh, by creating content. Uh, if you now, if you use um, uh, WhatsApp or uh, Instagram, you'll be able to, to have a chat companion that can advise you on a number of uh, topics. You can also create uh, stickers, images, and videos. I think this is the this is next step to make the experience of uh, users uh, richer. Um, when it comes to the, um, uh, the use of AI, uh, by telcos, I think I'll, I'll let my colleague from GSMA uh, uh, cover this, but um, in my opinion, AI was already used, the form of AI was already used, for example, in the self-optimized uh, networks. And the advances in uh, uh, predictive AI, I think, will help as well in um, uh, addressing the uh, uh, preventive maintenance, which will really reduce the cost for telcos and improve the quality of service. Uh, as well. Um, and at Meta, uh, something we, we did actually, we use uh, an open innovation approach. We developed what we call the uh, LAMA 2, which is large language model, and we made it available for researchers and uh, developers as well as uh, industry to use it and to, to build on it. And one of the use cases actually it's used by telcos because besides this technical parts, the self-optimized as well as the preventive maintenance, the uh, customer interaction is one part that will be really uh, revolutionized by, by AI, uh, not only by offering users some personalized uh, packages or offers uh, and getting to understand actually each individual users in a better way, but also in the way to interact through, for example, uh, customer care, for example, and the LAMA 2 large language model, uh, we are excited that is now being uh, considered to be used actually by telcos in order to help building this uh, new ways to interact with, uh, with customers. Yeah. I'll just touch on that very briefly. Is that from, 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 from a telco perspective, AI will be critical. You know, the networks of the future will be virtualized, they will be automated. Um, Adruma, you talked about you know, bringing the, the cloud closer to people. Well, in the telco world, that's what we call mobile edge computing. So with mobile edge computing, you're, you're pretty much going to have the network. You know, we call it at the edge, but that is pretty much everywhere. So you don't need to transmit data to somewhere very far 
for it to get processed there and come back with a feedback. It can be done locally, you know, as close to you as, as this desk is to us. Uh, now with 5G, we've seen a lot of densification. 6G is even going to bring more densification. The expectation is that your cell phone, your, your connected wristwatch, you know, your connected devices themselves can even become parts of the network themselves, you know. So I will begin to talk about things like mesh, you know, networks. With this volume of connected devices and networks and mobile edge computing, you're just going to rely, you're just going to have to rely on AI to be able to manage that network effectively. Yeah. You know, you, you can't, you can't rely on human beings. There's a limit to, to, you know, to what you know, the human beings can do. Going through a large volume of data to, to detect faults, to improve the network performance, that's the role AI will play you know, in telco networks. So for, for, for a lot of telecoms um, companies, they're gradually moving away from telcos into what they want to call digital you know, companies. So yeah, in a few years' time, we may stop using the word telcos and start calling them digital companies. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see, yeah. So I think that was in 35 minutes quite right about the future of the telecommunication industries. We covered quite a lot of topics about how the bits and bytes will come to you over the orbit uh, or over 6G or Wi-Fi or whatever. We covered a little bit of how we see new use cases evolving, but I'm sure you have some questions over here in the auditorium. So, hands popping up. So, um, Cecile, you were the first one. So. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Cecile. I'm pretty sure I have an unpopular question, but I'm still going to ask it. So um, how do we make sure we do not only connect devices or technologies, but also humanity? Because I have not heard humans once, only users. Uh, because I question myself, what is connectivity in a world where there are more connected devices than people? So the question is sometimes, are we stuck in this technology loop? Um, and how can we create human connectivity again? So my question, also grabbing back to the name of this panel, who are the guardians, is what responsibility would you take as developers, but also should we take to make sure all this connectivity does not dehumanize connection and is inclusive? So, and also who should guard, it, guard maybe also putting a stop to accelerate digital connectivity instead of like de let it decrease humanity. So I know it might not be a popular <laughs> question, but I'm really uh, curious what your answer will be. At least a good and important question. So who wants to go first? I will take it first. <laughs> okay, everyone is looking at me, so. <laughs> Otherwise, I do it. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, I think it's uh, it's good here to mention that I, I mentioned the metaverse and the future of, of the communication. I think it's it's important to uh, to emphasize that uh, this communications way or the future uh, ways communication uh, people will communicate are not really meant to replace the in-person interactions. I think the in-person interactions will remain there. It will be the most important for all of us. Um, the idea is really to, uh, to make the online uh, connections more meaningful for people and actually uh, improving this um, uh, sense of being uh, closer to one another despite of the physical distance. And I think this is the real value that the communication of, of the future will bring in terms of bringing humans uh, together. I'll, I want to respond, you know, from a slightly different perspective, and I must say it's a, it's a really great question. You know, I had to think a bit <laughs> about my response. It's easy for us, you know, in a, in a fast-moving industry like ours to continue to speed ahead 5G, 6G, who knows what comes next. But there are still people who don't even have 2G yet. And... Um, Yes, we're talking about connecting things, connecting devices, but even connecting those people is more important. In a world where we end up with a big digital divide between the connected and the unconnected, that in itself could throw up new challenges that maybe we can't even imagine today. So I think from that perspective, um, 
this should be you know, a kind of like reality check for us in the industry to take a step back and say, yes, it's good to move at top speed as we're currently doing, but let's think about you know, those who are not yet connected. How can we bring connectivity to them? We talked about the coverage gaps. Satellites would play a great you know, role in that, but beyond the coverage gap, the usage gap is even more important. So digital yeah. skills, and digital literacy, um, the right relevant content, you know, to bring those people online, and very importantly, affordable devices, you know, um, for them to get connected. Many of us can today afford, you know, 4G, 5G devices, but how about those who cannot afford a device more than twenty dollars? How can we make those devices, you know, um, bring those devices to the price point where those those people can can get connected? And I think when that happens, then that's even going to help, you know, the social interactions you talked about, you know, technology mm -hmm. helping us to, to communicate and interact with each other in a different way from, exactly. from the way we're doing now. But if people are not connected at all, then that doesn't apply to them. But yeah. I'm actually quite positive about, about the industry because there are a lot of things happening also in uh, underdeveloped countries where connectivity, the prices are going down tremendously. Even in Germany, we have in the meantime players who offer internet for free. So to a certain extent, connectivity is becoming a human right like water yeah. or electricity. But uh, if, if I can add just a couple of points here, if you allow me. Uh, on the access the over there and you yeah, answer in the okay. meantime. On the accessibility side, actually, uh, as, as you rightly mentioned, yeah, there are people that cannot afford, and this is actually one of the issues for the usage gap that we are facing now. Uh, what, what we do at Meta, actually, two, two things. As I mentioned, we are building the metaverse in a way that multiple devices can connect, not only the expensive AR and VR devices. And even for the AR and VR devices, we are doing a lot of efforts to bring the cost down. Uh, last year, we, we launched the what we call the MetaQuest Pro, which is a quite expensive uh, tool. But this year, we launched MetaQuest 3, which is actually at the same level of performance, if, if, if it's not even higher, and at low mixed reality, at one third of, of the cost. So this will continue and will allow people actually to gain more access to these devices. And just one last angle on the uh, inclusive access to, to technology. Uh, last year, I participated in um, an event in Dubai called the Access Ability uh, Forum or event which is really the use of technology for people with uh, disabilities. And if you see the, uh, the possibilities that these AR and VR devices offer for people with disabilities to experience new things that otherwise they will not be able to experience in the real world, you will be amazed. So it's, uh, I think it will add a lot of, uh, to that form. So next question coming up. Uh, hi. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Mohamed Mkayes. I want uh, to ask you, uh, we faced uh, big challenges uh, actually in our world. Uh, actually, uh, 2.5, uh, more than 2.5 uh, billion uh, people don't have access to the internet. Uh, so how can uh, we fix uh, or we solve these uh, big challenges uh, to ensure uh, all people uh, can have uh, access to new technologies and uh, all the people can uh, particip participate and build the, the future. Yeah, I mean, we'll yeah. <laughs> Short answer, it's, maybe then we have another chance for, for another one, so. Okay, yeah, no, it's, it's again, it's closely related to, to your question. Uh, it shows that while we may be looking at cutting edge technology um, for human beings, inclusiveness matters a lot. You know, having everyone, you know, move, maybe not at the same pace, but at least move in the same direction. Okay, um, so to your question, how do we bring these people online? It, it's something we, we, we do a lot, you know, at, at the GSMA and in my role specifically, which involves social research, um, it, it's looking at the reasons why they are not connected, okay? And um, there are, you know, f five reasons that we usually highlight a lot. Um, the, the first is, you know, the coverage gap. We've talked about that, you know, satellites gonna help us to, to, to cover that last mile. Then we have affordability. It's of devices yeah. and services, you know. Services are becoming cheaper, 
the vices yet, but not yet to the price point, you know, that many of these people would need to be able yeah. to, to connect. Um, digital skills and digital literacy, you know, um, if they pick up a device, the devices today are super complicated. You know, I, I recently upgraded to the, to the Pixel 8, and I'm struggling to, to fully learn how to use the Pixel 8. And this is somebody who has been using a smartphone, you know, for, for God knows how long. So think about, you know, somebody who is then seeing a smartphone for the first time ever. You know, how are they going to interact, you know, with that device? So in, improving and um, digital literacy and digital skills, very vital. Um, relevant content. Yeah. Now, we talk about this a lot, but um, I, I just completed a report on Indonesia um, last week, and that was when it struck me how important you know, relevant content is. There's a community in, in Indonesia um, who in July reached out to the government and said, cut off the internet to our community. Why? They said the content on the internet is changing their traditions and polluting the community. Okay, now that's because everything they're seeing are not relevant to them. And so they were like, look, if this is what the internet is, we're not interested, right? So cut off 3G, cut off 4G from our community. Yeah. If they had content that was relevant to them that reflected their culture, reflected their language, reflected their way of life, they will see the relevance in connectivity. You know, that's how important relevant content is. And the fifth one is security, okay? You know, online security for vulnerable communities, vulnerable people, women, children, you know, um, are there content online, you know, that could pretty much be, neg have a negative impact on them. That needs to be dealt with, you know, by governments at all level, you know, there's no, content that can um, um, pretty much harass people online or make them feel less than they are worth, you know, and yeah. things like that. If these five things can be tackled holistically, you know, by all stakeholders, governments, telcos, you know, um, uh, social media companies, um, pretty much everyone, then maybe, just maybe, we'll begin to see the needle move in the right direction. Yeah in terms of bringing those unconnected people online. One, one quick sentence while you, you hand over the mic. Actually, <laughs> all, our time is already yeah. almost over. So yeah. uh, last question, hopefully a short yeah. one. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Fantastic panel. And I think we're lucky to have such a diverse representation of uh, the, tel the broader connectivity space, let's call it. Um, I live in Dubai, so I'm a beneficiary of the hard work that the government does in connectivity and uh, balancing actually um, how that connectivity is done. Question or observation, and we can discuss it later, it doesn't have to take up more time. Two things, data monetization is where the big bucks are today. The billion dollar companies, the unicorns, it doesn't matter what technology they use, the main point is they're gathering data. So the question was really around as you evolve this network, how do you guys think about the ownership of that data and the privacy. So health, the second part was around health, which is that I can put 50 devices on my body, but at some point, some entity or a cross-section of entities needs to be responsible for measuring the health of its citizens as they do that. But the data um, ownership question is one that I'm very curious about because I'm for technology and I think we're going in great places, but that data uh, you know, where, who owns that data, where does it reside, will partly drive how connected I let my family be, for example. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave that for the regulator. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a very important subject. Um, our perspective is that data uh, is very important, of course, and we want to protect, it, pro protect the privacy of, of the users, protect the data. And, of course, you know, we have... Today we have a law still being uh, in, in action, but, but there is a law that follows, I would say, the, 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 um, the standards around the world. So for example, GDPR, trying to take it a, in a balanced approach, not to over-regulate and not to ver you know, intervene very, very early without looking uh, the whole aspect of, of, of uh, you know, the value that 
that the data would, would, uh, would create. So we're taking it a bit slowly, I would say. But I think because there is a great potential as well, because data is the fuel of the, of the economy. And, and remember that the GCC countries in general, they're moving away from oil-based economy to a more diverse uh, economy that is based on knowledge and data and technology. And, and it's one of the key pillars, you know, if you look at all the strategies produced, whether it's in the UAE or as well in the region, you know, they would talk about moving away from, you know, uh, carbon-based and oil-based economy into, into using, you know, catalysts like digital innovations, you know. So uh, we don't want to also, you know, um, uh, over-regulate and lose uh, 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 this uh, uh, opportunity, especially with the, all the geopolitical issues, the, the vision that you see around, you know, you, you see a lot of conflicts and challenges that happened since COVID and then, you know, political conflicts and economical wars, I would say, cold wars. So we have to be also, you know, we have to look at it from a holistic point of view because when you talk about digital uh, economy and internet, it's borderless. You know, you can't work in an isolation. You can't just think about, oh, I'll come up with this law and I'll do it this way and everybody will, 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 will follow. No, it's internet is a whole network of networks and it doesn't, it, it, I mean, if you come up with a law, it's okay. You come up with a law, but does it mean that everybody will, will follow it? They're not under your jurisdiction. So you have to look at where is the world is moving and you have to play along as well. You know? So I think your uh, concern is, is a very valid one and I think we're trying to balance it in a way that it protects you. We have a very stringent laws when it comes to cybersecurity and all of that. But at the same time, you know, allow this innovations and, and, and digital economy to flourish. And we want to be the center of that. We missed industrial revolution, I would say. You don't see, you know, gasoline cars being produced in, in GCC. We missed that. For a strict reason, of course. But we want to be part of the future industries like the digital uh, industry. And we want to be in the forefront and, and the leader uh, uh, position, not, not the, in the back seat and consume, consumer you know, position. So, with respect of time, I think we have to come to an end. I think balancing is a nice ending word. That's yeah. what you said. We have to balance our future. I think there are a lot of opportunities, but there are also some risks and challenges, and we are aware of them. If you have great solutions for them, we are happy. And I'm very happy that you attended and that you were my panel. So, yeah. thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Yusuf Break, I think Abdul Rahman and Lofty will leave in the afternoon. Kineshi and I will be here for tomorrow as well. So please feel free to connect and have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done, guys. <laughs> thank you. 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 I wanted to add uh, the bringing people. Actually, we partner with Telcos. We have a program called the Facebook Operator Service.